Leaves from a Russian Diary. Pitterim Sorokin. Part 1. 1917. Chapter 4. Light and Shadows. Today, April 22, was held a conference of the Social Revolutionary Party of Petrograd. The frame of mind of the new March Socialist Revolutionaries is radical in the extreme. Many old leaders of the party, Zenzinov, Gotz, and others, tried to reconcile the irreconcilables, but succeeded only in reinforcing the left wing. The conference was attended by Babushka Breshkovskaya, the venerable grandmother of the revolution, and also by Kerensky, the Minister of Justice, Citizen Kerensky, dressed in a simple jacket suit. Breshkovskaya also was simply dressed, as always. In vain these two supported our efforts to persuade the conference to moderate measures. It was all quite useless. The extremists simply insinuated that Kerensky was not a real revolutionist at all, but merely a minister of a bourgeois government. Sick Transit Gloria Mundi New revolutionists today are treating the oldest leaders as their servants. The new ones had a majority in the conference and passed a resolution that the war be brought to an immediate end, and that a socialist government be established. I declared that I could not accept this program, walked out of the conference and resigned my position as editor of Delo Naroda. Many old members followed me, most of the right wing abandoning the conference. Sooner or later this had to happen, so it was better to let it happen now. Bukowski and I are organizing a right-wing socialist revolutionary newspaper, The Will of the People. Grandmother Breshkovskaya, Miralyubov, Stalin Sky, and Arganov will be our co-editors. To hope for success at this time is impossible, still we have to do our duty. Delo Naroda, after our departure, became even more radical than before. Now it is in the hands of the middle and left sections of the party. The political immigrants continue to return. Of our party leaders these have appeared, Kurnov, Avksintiv, Bunikov, Stalinsky, Arganov, Lebedev and others. In a few days are expected the Bolshevist leaders, Lenin, Trotsky, Zinoviev and others. They are returning through Germany with the assistance of the German government, which has loaned them a special, Plombiert, wagon. Some of our people are indignant with the provisional government which permitted these persons to return. The rumor is spreading that Lenin and his companions, about 40 men, were hired by the German staff to incite civil war in Russia and still further to demoralize the Russian army. I know not if this is true, but if it is, what can the government do to prevent it? By the inflamed masses any attempt on the government's part would be regarded as counter-revolution. Along with the organization of our new paper we are organizing the right-wing members into a group called, The Will of the People. The fanaticism of the working classes and the intellectual proletarians of the town increases every day. These minorities are determined to rule Russia without consulting the peasants, who, as everyone knows, are the majority. Without the participation of the peasants it will be impossible to decide the future destiny of Russia. I am convinced of the necessity of summoning an all-Russian peasants conference or Soviet, to counterbalance the Soviet of idle workers and soldiers of the town. Night, wearied by speeches, meetings, and a hundred depressing incidents, I have returned home feeling like a man who tries to stop with his bare hands a great movement of ice from the mountains. A hopeless task. It might be better to step aside and let the ice crash down demolishing the village and all its population. Yet of course I cannot. With my friends we began the organization of the All-Russian Peasants Conference. I started yesterday from Petrograd to Veliky Ustyug, summoned there by the peasants and other inhabitants of the district. What a relief to leave the capital with its constantly moving crowds, its disorder, dirt, and hysteria, and to be again in the tranquil places I love. The steamer is gliding swiftly along the Sukona. Above me is the blue sky, under and around me the gleaming river and the beautiful scenery. How perfect is the calm of it all! How pure and still the air, as if no revolution exists! Only the constant chatter of the passengers recalls its presence. On the steamer a former friend, Mr. Vidishkin, is traveling. Alas, this man, three months ago patriot, 
now has become a Bolshevik and is going to Veliky Ustyug to spread Bolshevist propaganda. On seeing me he was at first a little abashed, but later he began to expound to me his new faith. I made no comment, and my silence appeared to irritate him more than objections might have done. I have reasons to think the motives of his change of doctrine are mercenary, and that he has hopes of profiteering. Perhaps he suspected my opinion of him. At my beloved Veliki Ustiag a group of friends met me. From the steamer I was driven to the marketplace where thousands of people were assembled. My speech evoked great patriotic enthusiasm. Hundreds pressed forward to subscribe to the state loan of freedom issued by the government for the economic improvement of the state. Many peasants who had come to town to sell their corn gave it to the army without charge. I had a similar triumph at a meeting of teachers and among the simple people of three neighboring villages. At the teachers' conference Mr. Vitishkin tried to speak, but the audience refused to listen to him. Thank God, the state of mind here is saner than in Petrograd. To return to the unhealthy atmosphere, the disorder, and unrestraint of the capital was frightful. Lenin and his companions have arrived. Their first speeches at the Bolshevist conference embarrassed even members of the extreme left. Lenin and his group are now very rich men, and as a consequence the number of Bolshevist newspapers, pamphlets, proclamations, etc., have greatly increased. Trotsky has taken a very expensive apartment. Where did all this money come from? That is the question. Socialization has begun. The Bolsheviki have forcibly taken possession of the villa of the dancer Kshasinsky, the anarchists have seized the villa of Dernovo and other houses, the proprietors being summarily expelled. Although the owners have appealed to the courts and to the government, nothing has been done to restore their property. April 21, 1917 Today we have had a real taste of mob revolt. The Foreign Office note to the Allies, stating that the provisional government would be faithful to all treaties and obligations undertaken by Russia, was furiously attacked by the Soviets and by the Bolsheviki, who saw in it a declaration in favor of annexations and contributions, and of old imperialistic aspirations. To any reasoning mind it was absurd to speak of annexations by a Russia already half-dead. Of course the real object of the attack was destruction of the bourgeois government hundreds of propagandist speakers fill the town, protesting and raising demonstrations. Hundreds of thousands of proclamations calling for revolt, demanding the dismissal of Milyakov and other capitalistic ministers, are displayed in factories, barracks, offices, and on the streets. Everywhere are open air as well as indoor meetings. Side by side with Bolshevist speakers stand others defending the policies of the government. Violent speeches are often followed by fights. About noon today came a rumor that two regiments, fully armed, had left their barrack to support the rioters. Firing began. Sacking of shops by criminals became general. The situation resembled the first days of anti tsarist revolt, but in those days citizens were able to control the masses. Late last night the rioters were momentarily dispersed, but they had already achieved their purpose. The government has announced that Milyakov is to be dismissed. This means that the government has fallen, for this first concession to the mob and to the Bolsheviki is the beginning of the end of the provisional government. We are all living on the edge of a volcano, and at any moment an eruption may burst forth. Not a pleasant situation, but step by step we manage to adapt ourselves to it. At any rate it is all interesting enough. Today we published the first copy of The Will of the People, the paper met with an instant success, almost all old social revolutionaries buying it, and sending us letters, questions, and greetings. I am not too optimistic, yet I think we may be able to make an impression. The organization of the All-Russian Peasants Conference is proceeding successfully and is approaching achievement. Van der Velde and de Broker, leaders of the Belgian Socialists, paid a visit to our office today. You are the first Russian socialists who do not denounce our patriotism and our bourgeois opinions. Said Van der Velde in shaking hands with me. It is true. These distinguished men, leaders of international socialism, as well as Henderson, Albert Thomas, 
and representatives of the English, Belgian, and French working classes have been treated with great discourtesy by the Soviet and by many who, two or three months ago, were moderate Socialist Party members. I am bitterly ashamed of this, but Vandervelde seems to understand the abnormal conditions in which we struggle. This evening we gave a dinner to Albert Thomas. He, like Vandervelde, regards the situation rather pessimistically, but he treated the rudeness of the Soviet with good humor. They are like irresponsible children. He said. My manner of living has become regular in its irregularity. I have no definite time for dinner, for sleeping, rising, or working. Day after day I tire myself out in agitation, excitement, and in carrying on a multitude of business. I sometimes feel like a homeless dog.